I'm Destin Harrison, and you're listening to the Gig Salad Green Room Interviews. Today's guest's resume is about as long as his name is unique. Ptolemy Slocum has acted in The Sopranos, Burn Notice, Pretty Little Liars, Preacher, and my own personal favorite, Hitch. More recently, Ptolemy has been featured in HBO's major-budget sci-fi series, Westworld, where he plays a technician named Sylvester. During our interview, Ptolemy told us what it was really like working on the set of Westworld, how the cast dealt with some of the situations that the show required of them, and he gave some really good advice about how to succeed in the entertainment industry. We're here with Ptolemy Slocum. Ptolemy, how are you doing? Good. So good. My new response for people is so good. So it, good. It's kind of a little too positive. Catches people off guard. It's like, <laughs> whoa, hey, easy now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't overdo it. Are you yeah. an overachiever? Uh, no. No, I'm I'm, uh, I, I'm probably like overambitious underachiever. It's one of those things where you're constantly thinking you should be doing more. Do you know that feeling? Okay. That very American feeling? Uh-huh. Um, that's, that's the end result, uh, where I have a bunch of ideas, but then I don't do them. Well, I yeah. want to get into those ideas cause I'm curious what you're working on and what we can look out for in the future. But first of all, your parents were not very considerate of talk show hosts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think they, I think they threw down a gauntlet. I think they kind of knew what they're doing. I'm actually not sure if they knew what they were doing. Um, I was... Uh, I grew up in Northern California in this like farm town and everybody just rejected the name because it was like a small town. But I was born in Kenya of all places and I was born on the eclipse of the moon. And so they're no- looking at names of astronomers. And uh, there was a Greek astronomer who lived in Egypt when the Greek empire owned Egypt. And so there was like an Egyptian thing, an astronomy thing. Yeah. And so there, there was a man named Ptolemy Slocum and he proved that the earth is the center of the solar system. And they believed that for 300 years. So he's basically the most misguided scientist ever. Uh, and that's who I was named after. So it's auspicious, inauspicious. Interesting. Yeah. Being born on the eclipse of the moon, does that mean something? Does it, are you like a demigod or something like that? No. Is that- no, I'm definitely not a demigod. I've seen myself naked. <laughs> so you went from Kenya to California. How'd that go down? A um, lot of broken family. Uh, my family split up. We were back in Cincinnati and my mother went to where her, her mother was and was just like teaching in the middle of nowhere, Northern California. So that's where I grew up. Small town. It's really interesting because I was, I had the name Ptolemy. I had red hair and I had freckles and I was just like, I had like 20 targets on me at all times. And that's a rough, it's admittedly a rough name. Uh, toilet paper me, tamale Twatomy. Uh it was it was pretty it was pretty brutal. But then I also had like freckles and red hair. I was just like I was like the candy store of uh any anything you want to make fun of. I'm sure you blended in incredibly well in Kenya. Uh no, well actually, um you may be kidding, but red, the color red in the um in that culture, the Maasai culture is actually sacred. So had I grown up in Kenya, I would have had like the opposite experience. I would have been like the king of everything. And instead, I grew up in a farming area of Northern California. You could have been a demigod. I I could have been the demigod I was promised. I will say, though, you are my favorite Ptolemy I've ever met. Yeah, I think me too. I did meet another Ptolemy, Ptolemy Tompkins. uh, Really cool guy. But we met in a coffee shop. In New York, we're like the only two semi-middle-aged Ptolemies, I think, in America that we're aware of. And uh, awesome guy. There's obviously like things to relate to with somebody named Ptolemy. So that was fun. So here's a request for our listeners. If anybody else out there who listens to this podcast is named Ptolemy, yeah. hit us up. We want to know. Yeah, I'll meet them. I'll meet so calling all Ptolemies. Yeah. So let's shift gears here a little bit. Tell us about your career. Yeah, I, I mostly did a ton of commercials which you've probably seen more recently I've done, you know, Veep and Preacher. And then the big one now is Westworld. So that's what I've been doing recently. Um, with Nerdist, I've, bu- I've been building an uh, improv comedy and acting school sketch. We do a bunch of different classes in Los Angeles. Um, I teach, teach there and, um, 
uh, help run the program. So that's that's what I've been using my time for recently. So let's go to Westworld. Yep. The show has been huge so far. Yeah. HBO is killing it. So well made. Oh my gosh. Yeah, beautifully produced. I don't I don't I don't talk about the show that much as much as I like talk about it because I really haven't been able to until the season comes to a close because they're very, very protective of the information. Like you're not allowed to have cell phones on set. Like it's very protective. But really to think about like to talk about how many cylinders that show is running on, not only is there so much plot going on, there's so much acting, like directing, there's so many moving parts, but think about how hard they made it on themselves because all of the scenes that I'm in are in these glass building, you know, these glass rooms, but to shoot in a glass room is just 1 million reflections. So I don't think people realize they've never seen really a set like that before that's floor to ceiling glass with black. It's the reason why is because technically impossible. Like for us to do that to even turn around, all everyone behind the camera has to be in black and have black curtains. So they did all of this under incredibly difficult circumstances, incredibly difficult storytelling, incredibly difficult like technical elements all simultaneously and they come out with a product that actually has its has a narrative, you know? Like any one of those I would kind of have been impressed with, but they are sort of doing them all. And man, just to see where it's gone has been really impressive as a fan, just to be able to watch the shows. Because I never got a single script. I never saw a story. I only saw the scenes that we were in. Like, they kept us as in the dark as our characters are, which I think is, like, super fun. And I really enjoyed I really enjoyed it because it felt like it was on the show. So tell us about what it's like to be filming on that set. Because first of all, a lot of naked people. Yeah. Lots of nudity. The number of naked people, like what you're looking at that, at that set, almost everyone is a live person. So all of those quote unquote cadavers are all people um, that they actually put makeup on sometimes for like wounds. It's only if you see a body that's like in half that doesn't have legs or something, that is a dummy. Everything else is real. And so like I remember the first day – one of the first days was just this huge room full of naked people being hosed down is like in the second episode, which was actually the pilot. Um, and, uh, and so they would yell cut and then the still room would kind of like come to life. And there were these little giggles like, because <laughs> when do adults lay around together, mixed gender, fully nude, just like, hanging around it's it was such a weird experience and i think for everyone it was like weird at first and then it became so common it became so common that like someone that would be new to the set would have a different like feel this almost like defensive feel to it and it's like oh i remember that i remember when this was like new and weird and like what does this feel like but it in reality Come to find out, we are all completely naked underneath our clothes. It's just that we're wearing clothes. And it just becomes like a common place thing. I think I was also saved by the fact that I wasn't wearing my glasses. And I, like, can't really see that well. So then, like, I was just, like, kind of fuzzy. And, I the, like, one of the most biggest letdowns of my life is that you cannot tell the gender of someone maybe 10 feet away from you with your glasses off. It's like, is that a boy or a girl? Especially when they're <laughs> laying down. And I'm like, man, I'm so let down right now. Like, I, I don't even know what these are. It's just like body parts. You know how they say if you're nervous about a performance, you should just picture everybody around you naked? Yeah, don't do that. It's very distracting. Uh, at least for me. You know, uh, I've never tried. Well, let's do it. I'm going <laughs> to, in fact... Why don't we just say that we're not wearing clothes? We are both sitting here comfortably nude, which in America is rare. You know, like we need more comfortably nude interviews. Do you want to talk about your tramp stamp? Do you want to tell people about that? Uh, that well, I was young. Um, basically, I had a bunch of friends who all said that they were going to do it. And turns out that none of them did it. And I now I have this tramp stamp. Been there, man. I've yeah. Been there. You know, I have uh, your name, Ptolemy on the inside of my foot yeah you don't need to tell me because i can see it because we're both naked i just want to make sure that you 
that you no, saw it. No, my eyes we... function. Okay. All right. Yeah, I just, I'm I mean, uncomfortable. Your eyes function. My eyes are up here. Honestly, though, has that ever happened where, like, you sit down to lunch, you take a break on set or something, and you see somebody and you're like, I just saw you naked. Is that... Is that I mean, weird yeah, at like, all? like I said, I think it was weird at first, and then it was absolutely like normal. There were these light gray uh, robes, bathrobes. And so at lunch, like half of everybody is in a bathrobe. And so there's whole tables of people in bathrobes. Also, awkward, uh, something that you react to as a human being is seeing like dead things or like people bleeding, or because if you think nudity is weird, to see distressed flesh or dead people is actually kind of just as weird. It makes you worry for them. It's like, oh, no, are you okay? Kind of thing. I'm Destin Harrison, and you're listening to the Gig Salad Green Room Interviews. The new year is here, and along with it comes a new set of resolutions. So here's one more to add to your list. How about making 2017 the most memorable year you've had? At Gig Salad, we want to help you create unforgettable moments. So be sure to visit gigsalad.com to find out how we can help. Gig Salad. Gig Salad. Gig Salad. salad. You're listening to the Gig Salad Green Room Interviews. I like this salad. Tell us about your character. Sylvester yeah. is kind of a jerk. Yeah, he is. You got to understand, the thing is, Sylvester, and I'm speaking from Sylvester's point of view, but Sylvester is dealing with a lot of idiots. And it is frustrating to have to go to work with idiots. And so we're catching him from a vantage point of, you know, I, I related to a, a friend of mine uh, and we talk about like, you know, like working out at the Apple store that like the intake of human beings and the questions and like how you get tired of dealing with people that are, just have like the same issues. Um, and that was really kind of like my vantage point. Like this is my job. I work on iPhones that happen to look like human beings and I don't understand why this – like people get confused about this all the time um, until those issues become somebody's threatening you. With yeah. A so everything that we're dealing with in this season, you're, you're looking at um, really strange circumstances, like abnormal, very dangerous situation, but that is not the norm. Like we're not looking at normal day day to day you get a sense of what the day to day would be at Westworld maybe like for our job um but i think this is like uh obviously we're looking at a very unique um set of circumstances that none of these guys have ever faced before so really poor choices really poor behavior and i pay for it especially as a character but i do understand him like i get where he's coming from. And I think from the outside, it comes across real poorly, but I never had an issue. Like I, I honestly, it was shocking to me to see the show because the whole time I thought it was just, just this like charming guy. Uh, and then when you watch the show, it was like, Oh man. So I was kind of surprised myself. You know, I can see that you kind of do sympathize with him a little bit. Yeah. Especially the circumstances that Sylvester and the surrounding characters get into. That's a rough day at work. It's awful. And it's totally like none of that is expected. None of this is like, uh, this is what I thought it was going to be. This is how I thought it was going to go. It's all this like, uh, I can't, I have to make this decision because of these other decisions. It's a small decision. And once you make that small decision, it's like, ah, I shouldn't have done that. Now I need to do this. You know, like just following bad with worse. Uh the other thing about that show is it happens on various levels. There are people on that show that are, as you described earlier, demigods. Like these are obviously like people that are way smarter than any human uh, that we know. Like these are people like incredibly intelligent people. And then there are Felix and Sylvester who are not those people. These are, these are very – they're doing the best they can and they're, they are not – like paragons of thought or wisdom. They're, they're just like, 
in some ways more naked than the people on the show because they're like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not like, I'm not a genius. I'm just here. Sometimes people don't give enough lack of credit to them because there's so many like geniuses uh, walking around that show. And that's not these guys. These guys are, they're doing the best they can. I like to equate them to like, um, like baristas or like dudes at the genius bar. They're like, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. You know what I mean? Just trying to like pass things off. Yeah. So I don't know, instead of putting whipped cream on a frappe, you're like putting an arm on a human. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's good at his job. I mean, he's very good. He owns his little world, but he just doesn't know how to handle it. He doesn't know how to handle like actual real world insanity. Overall though, the show's amazing. Incredible work. The production value is off the charts. The acting is so good. Seriously, all-star cast. Everybody in that show is incredible. It's well-written. It's well-made. So whatever they do, it's going to be fantastic. I'm positive. Yeah, that that's the same position I'm in because in many ways I'm a fan because I only know my own stuff. But, man, just to, just to be a part of something that you can release from and have it just take you along with it, both – Inside of it, as you produce it, there's so much trust that you have to have because there's so little information that we have uh, that you have to believe that you're a part of something that they understand and that they know when you're doing it right or wrong or they understand how you fit into the bigger piece. And the same as us as fans, you, you just like release from it and witness it. And it's a great – I love I love having that relationship to a project when the project earns it. So this is – it's just been a dream job. As we wrap up here, do you have any advice that you can give other actors, other comedians, other performers who are trying to get where you are right now? Probably the most helpful thing that changed my relationship to the work, uh, and that was – it's in the direction of um, a day job. And until I got it to the point that it was a product, I, I had almost no success. I think a lot of us, when we're doing this, we're following a passion, we're following a love, we're following uh, a craft, we're following our art, we're following our like our life, and these are the things that we want to be expressing. And the problem is, is that we tie too many things up into that, uh, too much judgment of ourselves, too much judgment of other people, um, and we're like, oh, I'm going to express myself and do these things that uh, are just going to like light up the world. And it ends up being a very muddled approach to the work. Like when you go into auditions, you want it. And what the people in that room and the work that comes out of you ends up being a want and not you. And so the biggest piece of advice that changed my life was, uh, to separate from the results and separate from the want. Uh, the first way it was translated in my mind is like to not want it anymore. Almost want, by the time you are past it, then you start um, accomplishing it because now you're doing work instead of want. Uh, but the true thing that saved my life, I think, is uh, having kids. And the way, I, the way I frame that is like have your own life. Because you must be living for your life in order to go into somewhere and not look for your life in that project, not look for your life in the, the things that you do outside of yourself. So get yourself a family. And if it's not a family, get yourself a passion. Get yourself something that you care about as much or more than the work you're doing. Because I've seen a lot of actors in many, in many areas of this entire world. A lot of them are desperate. A lot of them are passionate. A lot of them send a lot of headshots. They, they, they treat it as an industry. But the ones that are actually successful live their lives and do this as an outcropping of themselves. This is my advice. Have a full life. Be your life. And allow this to just be something that you, that you do. And when you get to that point, when you don't need this anymore, you can actually execute what you always wanted to in it. That goes for comedy. You can tell the difference between a stand-up that is comfortable on stage and a stand-up that needs something from the audience. And this is not 
You don't need to be a trained audience. You know, as a person sitting there, you know if this person is desperate or not. So get yourself get yourself something in your life you care about, and um, and bring the work just to the work. That's my biggest piece of advice. Ptolemy Slocum, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gig Salad Green Room interviews. Don't forget to follow and subscribe to stay updated with us here in the Green Room. And as always, be sure to visit gigsalad.com to find out how we can help you book something awesome. For everyone here in the Gig Salad Green Room, I'm Destin Harrison. Thanks for listening.